Cowboys have plenty of questions entering 2022. No questions about Michael Parsons, who was spectacular last year as a rookie and who has set the bar very high for himself. Here's what he said about his goals via theathletic.com. Last year, I was trying to find myself. This year, I know exactly who I need to be, the best player in the league. I'm not talking about the best defensive player. I want to be the greatest. That's the type of mindset I have and the confidence I have being the best player in the league doesn't mean you're going to have 20 sacks. Being the best player in the league means you're leading your team to a championship and having the best defense. Well, being the best defensive player in the league and being regarded as the best player in the league when you don't have the stats that scream out, you have to be the guy that just is disruptive. Everything you do is blowing holes in the line and creating opportunities for other guys to get to the football and make the plays. It may take a better understanding of the game to recognize that Parsons is as great as he is if he doesn't have 20 sacks. But, Shereen, look, I, I like the confidence. I think anybody who's going to thrive at the NFL level needs to have that kind of confidence. And they go out and play the games, and we find out who is the best and who isn't the best. But somebody will emerge this year as the best player, and Michael Parsons did enough last year that we at least have to take him seriously. This isn't just some hollow boast. This is a guy who showed plenty last year, and he could become – Maybe the best defensive player in the league. Best player in the league, I, I, he's got some work to do because there's always going to be some great offensive players that people tend to gravitate to. Yeah, that's exactly right, Mike. And as you and I both know, two defensive players have won the MVP award, award uh, previously, and it hasn't happened in forever. Um, and in fact, quarterbacks over since Adrian Peterson, what was that, 10 years ago? I think the last yes. nine have been uh, quarterbacks who have won the MVP award. So the best player normally is the quarterback. Heck, a receiver's never even won the MVP award. But I digress. Micah Parsons had one of the best rookie seasons for a defensive player, in my mind, in the history of the NFL. I mean, he was outstanding, 13 sacks. That's why he made first-team All-Pro. It's why he was unanimous as the defensive rookie of the year. It's why he finished second in defensive player of the year voting. And I do think he's a favorite for that award this season. There's two other players who are ahead of him in the odds, and that's Miles Garrett, um, and uh, who was the Aaron, Aaron Donald. Donald, of course. We can't forget Aaron Donald. But I think he is becoming that guy who is as disruptive as Aaron Donald is, Mike. And I think he can become that player. I think he can become the best defensive player in football. It's going to take a lot to do that, to pass Aaron Donald in that conversation. But he was outstanding last season, and he's a reason that the Cowboys won that division last year. It's the dynamic that Chris Sims calls F up the play. The guy yeah. who completely blows up what the offense is trying to do, even if he doesn't make the tackle, even if he doesn't get a hand on the quarterback, even if he has no ultimate say in how the play ends, his effort to derail the play from the snap is the thing that becomes a critical factor in shutting down an offense. And that's what Parsons has the capacity to do. Lawrence Taylor, 1986, Allen Page, 1971. And in between those two, a kicker won the MVP. Yes, kids, dare to dream. If a kicker can win the NFL MVP award, anything can happen. <laughs> anything at all. Uh, so that's where Parsons is. But, you know, there's still plenty of question marks with the Cowboys. Let's do a little game of better, yeah. worse, or same for this Cowboys team that overachieved last year relative to their expectations. They really are kind of on a roller coaster ping pong thing where good year, bad year, good year, bad year. Expectations high, they fail. Expectations low, they thrive. This year, expectations maybe a little higher than they should be, but we'll take a closer look. Let's start with the defense. Will it be better, worse, or the same as last year in your estimation, Shereen? Well, I'm going to say better, but it's going to be hard to do because they did force 34 turnovers um, and were just outstanding in that category. But you think about, Mike, just two years ago, this was the worst defense in franchise hi history, gave up the most points in franchise history. And Dan Quinn comes in and completely turns them around very quickly in one year. And, and they're a really good defense. I think they're going to be an even better defense this year, and they're going to have to be to keep this team in. 
uh, in the games, and I think they're going to do that. I don't know if they're going to force as many turnovers, but I think overall they're going to be a better defense. Michael Parsons is going to be a better player in his second year than he was in his first year. They hope to have Demarcus Lawrence for the entire season. Hope he doesn't have those injuries that he had last year when he broke that foot in practice after the season opener. If all those things go right, I think this is going to be one of the best defenses in football this season, Mike. See, I think the defense is going to be worse because there's going to be more pressure on it this year. Because the offense, I think, is going to take a step back. And that's the one thing that we always have to keep in mind. When you assess the defense, you have to keep in mind the offense. When you assess the offense, you have to keep in mind the defense. What kind of pressure is the other unit's shortcomings placing on the one that we're focused on? And I think that the defense is going to have a harder time this year because the offense isn't going to be as potent. And I don't want to I don't want to spoil my selection, but I'm looking at these categories and I have a feeling worse is going to become a trend for me because I just think across the board, the Cowboys, <laughs> uh-huh. the Cowboys aren't going to be as good as they were last year. And it's mainly on the offensive side of the ball. But I think because of the offensive side of the ball, it's going to make it harder for the defense to be as good as it was last year. So long story short, again, worse. Yeah, and and you're right about that, and you're right about the offense, and it is going to put more pressure on the defense. And so they're going to keep them in games, but are they going to be on the field too much and they get tired at the end of the game? That's what we're going to see, Mike. But I agree with you. I think the offense is going to take a step back, which does put more pressure on your defense. Well, and and if if your offense isn't scoring points and putting pressure on the opposing offense to maybe take some chances, it's harder to get those 34 turnovers that they had last year with Trayvon Diggs having all of the interceptions and pick sixes and whatnot. All right, offensive line. Better, worse, or same? Yeah. That's an easy one. Uh, It's easy. They're going to be worse. And, you know, I talked about how the defense two years ago was the worst in the NFL and turned around very quickly. It's amazing how quickly this offensive line has gone from the best. And and at one point, you know, we were thinking they may be the best in NFL history, at least in the conversation with all the all-pro players and potentially Hall of Fame players they have on the offensive line and all of a sudden we're looking at them now and going it's a shell of itself and you know the rookie Tyler Smith's gonna have to start at least start the season at left tackle until Jason Peters can get his feet underneath him but Connor Williams is gone so that's gonna be Connor McGovern at left guard and Lyle Collins is gone so it's Terrence Steele an undrafted guy who played pretty well last year at right tackle and then What's Zach Martin going to do? Is he going to stay healthy all season? That, that's becoming a question with as long and as well as he's played and as many hits as he's taken in his career. So lots of questions for me in this offensive line. And it always comes down, Mike, Bill Parcells used to always say this, you build around your offensive line and your defensive line. And if either one of those is not very good, your team's probably not going to be very good. This offensive line, I think, is not going to be very good. Yeah, and the epitome of that that uh, position from Bill Parcells over the past 20 years has been the Giants teams that won the Super Bowls in 2007 yeah. and 2011, even though Parcells was long gone by the time that happened. Offensive line, defensive line. It's not sexy. It has no relevance to fantasy football. When the offensive line is good, you notice it less. Isn't that weird? The better the offensive line is, the more the spotlight shines on the guys who benefit from the great offensive line. Back in 2016, when the offensive line was at its peak, it was all about the two rookies who were in the MVP conversation, Dak and Zeke. Dak and Zeke. Why? Because they had full opportunity to take the most that they could from their skills because the offensive line was opening holes and buying time. And that, and I agree with you again, worse you know, Tyron Smith. It's worse. Tyler Smith. This could be the thing that kickstarts a career that makes him one of the best. He's getting thrown into the fire right out of the gates, sink or swim. And if he, if he survives and thrives, then you've got yourself a great cornerstone left tackle to take over for Tyron Smith. I, I, it could work out perfectly for the Cowboys, but as Jerry Jones said recently, there is a price to pay by relying upon a rookie right out of the gates at that position. Guy's 21 years old. They had Jason Peters at age 40, and here's Tyler Smith at 21. 
uh, passing game, which kind of ties with the offensive line. But let's just focus on the pieces of the puzzle here. And I think this is another one's fairly easy. Better, same, or worse in your estimation, Shireen? Yeah, it is easy. It's worse. And, and it's easy to say that when you lose Amari Cooper. And again, I've said this repeatedly, and I'm going to continue to say it, no matter how Amari Cooper does in Cleveland, and I think he's going to do pretty well, but they mismanaged this offseason, and that was the biggest thing that they mismanaged. They got a fifth-round pick for him, Mike. That's not enough. If they had gotten a first-rounder, a second-rounder, something, they gave up a first-rounder to get him. If they'd gotten something of value for him, I might say, okay, that was a good trade. But they didn't, it came down to they did not want to pay the $20 million to a guy that they saw as their number two receiver behind C.D. Lamb, who did lead them in receptions and receiving yards last season. So they didn't want to give him that money. Well, what's happened this offseason, $20 million is not that much for a receiver. And I get it. You think he's your number two receiver. But is C.D. Lamb going to be the same receiver that he was last year without Amari Cooper opposite him? I don't know that. And, and now they're relying a lot of the, on those young guys to step up. They may, they may not. Noah Brown, Jalen Tolbert, uh, Kevontae Turpin, who looked good in the return game, all those guys, now they're, they're relying on, at least early in the season, without Michael Gallup, without James Washington, they're going to be putting a lot of pressure on those guys. I just don't think their passing game is going to be very good early on. Shereen, I think the Amari Cooper situation is an example of an organization that makes a decision and refuses or just fails to revisit it. I think when yeah. they signed Amari Cooper to that five-year, $100 million contract, and we instantly saw in the details that the way it works out, it's $40 million over two years, and then he's quite possibly going to be gone. I think they decided at the time they signed him, we're keeping him for two years, we're not going to pay him $20 million in year three, we're not going to pay a receiver that kind of money, we're going to reinvest in other positions or save that money for C.D. Lamb or whoever else is playing receiver, and they just never revisited it. And they were going to cut him. He, he was just going to be released. They, they found someone that was willing to take on that contract – and restructure it. He still gets $20 million this year, but they've restructured it. They've, and that's what the Cowboys could have done. They could have said, we're taking that $20 Should've million, done. and we're going we're gonna to pay you, you know, a $19 million signing bonus, and we're going to spread it out and reduce the cap hit. And, yeah, I think they just never bothered to ask themselves, where is the market going, and are we making a mistake here, giving up a guy who really is worth $20 million in the grand scheme of things? I, I you know— I don't want to even try to psychoanalyze Jerry Jones because I'm not sure that it's something that can be successfully done. <laughs> but I just wonder whether there's just a certain amount of resentment over the fact that they paid Dak more than they wanted to pay because they couldn't get Dak to just kind of go along with, you know, they take less. You make, you make plenty of money yeah. off the field as a Cowboys quarterback, so why are you trying to get so much money out of us? And the same thing with Zeke. He held out, and they paid him way too much money, and he'd be gone now but for the structure of that contract. I just can't help but wonder whether or not they just – they were just going to – we're not paying Amari Cooper $20 million. After paying Dak more than we wanted to pay and Zeke more than we wanted, we're just not going to pay the guy $20 million, even if in hindsight or with the application of foresight, they should have realized it was money well spent. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I think when they structured the contract as they structured it, they had a plan in mind and they just stuck to that plan and never even thought this offseason, well, maybe we should reconsider this. Maybe we should keep Amari Cooper and wait and see how the market plays. They they had just made up their minds and, and that's what they went with. And it's unfortunate for Dak Prescott and unfortunate for the Cowboys because I don't think they're going to be as good. Even when, when James Washington and Michael Gallup get back, and look, I'm a huge Michael Gallup fan, but he's coming off an ACL tear January 2nd. It wasn't that long ago. I just don't know how good he's going to be this year. They may be better in, in the passing game next year when Michael Gallup's a year away from that injury. But right now this year, I don't think they're better off with, with Michael Gallup in, instead of – Michael Gallup and James Washington instead of Amari Cooper, I don't think they're better off. 
Echoing a point we made last week talking about the Jimmy Garoppolo contract. Now, again, he was in year five, not year three. Cooper was in year three, and it's more common to have these protections early in a contract. But the reason the Cowboys had to do what they did, that $20 million was yeah. becoming fully Timing. guaranteed early in the league year. That, kids, is one of the benefits of having an early trigger that forces a team to make a decision. The Cowboys had to make a decision, and as we agree – they had made that decision basically the moment they signed the contract and they never bothered to revisit it. And if they were trying to revisit it, they really didn't have it. They didn't have a chance to see what was happening at the market at receiver. They didn't have a chance to see what Devontae Adams was going to get from the Packers or someone else. They didn't have an opportunity to see what happened with Tyree Kill or A.J. Brown or D.K. Metcalf or anyone else because there was a trigger in March that forced them to get Amari Cooper off the roster before that $20 million became Fully guaranteed with no reduction, no restructuring, $20 million on the books this year. All right, uh, penalties, which have been a problem for the Dallas Cowboys and a point of contention and discussion and focus. Better, worse, or same this year, Shireen? Well, based on the preseason game against the Broncos when they had 17, I'm going to say the same, Mike. I'm going to say they're going to lead the league again in penalties and I know, again, going back to Bill Parcells, he said, look, I don't coach penalties, but you got to figure out some way to reduce those penalties if you're the Cowboys. If you're not as good on offense, Mike, you can't have the penalties, particularly the pre-snap penalties where you're killing yourself with false starts and delays of games and all those types of things. If they do that, it's going to be a really long season for this team and not living up to the expectations uh, of Jerry Jones. And I was going to say, I paused, I was going to say the expectation of the fans, but the fans are really down on this team based on the fans I've talked to here recently. They don't think they're going to do a whole lot. I heard some say a max of eight wins and some others said a max of nine wins. I haven't heard any Cowboys fan yet say more than nine wins. Well, you know, one of the realities of the offseason is you take advantage of the various devices available to you to make your team better, and there just isn't a sense. Anyone who's been paying attention, the Cowboys have done anything dramatic or significant right. to make the team better. Cooper's gone. Randy Gregory's gone. Tyron Smith is injured. There's just a sense that they're just hoping to tread water as it relates to what they did last year. Well, last year, what it got them was a one-and-out playoff appearance. So... um I, I really think, and I, and I know that Jerry Jones has no reason to even entertain publicly the possibility of Mike McCarthy being on the hot seat. I think he is. Everybody knows Sean Payton's available and is ready to come back next year. And if Jerry Jones is ever going to hire Sean Payton, and we know that he tried to in 2019, and they've been linked together for a long time, it's going to happen after this season or not at all. And McCarthy's got a lot of work to do, I think, to keep this job because it is not it is not starting well for the Cowboys. Now, watch. They'll beat the Buccaneers by 20 points, and then everything changes. And, and hey, it's good to have the bar low for every team. Pete Carroll was pushing back on the idea that expectations are low for the Seahawks. You want your expectations to be low because then when you, yeah. when you get to 500, it looks like a win. If the expectations are too high, 500 is a disappointment. I just don't know what reasonable expectations should be for the Cowboys this year. They're going to have their hands full winning the division, and even in a wide-open NFC, they're going to have their hands full making it to the playoffs. We're going to have a draft coming up, Shereen, of teams that have no chance to make it to the playoffs. But what is your gut feeling right now on this Cowboys team as up or down, yes or no, in or out of the playoffs? Um, I did not have them, Mike, on our PFT playoff predictions. I do not have them making the playoffs. And just look at their first six games. They have the Bucks and Bengals at home. If they go 0-2 at home, which I the Bucks probably are the team they have the best chance to beat. I mean, they almost beat them last year in Tampa to open up the season. Then they go at the Giants and Washington should win both of those. Then it's at Rams, at Eagles. They have a chance to start the season, Mike, 2-4. and four. And then... The schedule gets much easier, but boy, you're trying to, to, from that point on, you're trying to dig yourself out of the hole, and it, it, it's just going to be hard with those first six games if they can't pull some upsets there and beat some people that I don't think they'll probably beat. And I don't have them making the playoffs. I do think it'll be in that 8-9 win range. 
Um, I have the Eagles winning, winning the NFC East and the Cowboys finishing second and not making the postseason. And if that happens, Mike McCarthy is not going to be the head coach of the Cowboys the next season. Now, I, I'm putting, as you know, I'm putting my money on Dan Quinn to be the next head coach of the Cowboys, and I think he will be. But Sean Payton is in the conversation for sure. I just think he's going to want too much money, more than Jerry's going to want to pay. I don't think Jerry's going to want to give, give up the draft picks. And I know for certain that Sean will want Jerry Jones to take a step back, and we all know that's probably not going to happen either. Maybe it will. Maybe it'll be like the Bill Parcells situation when he says, my time's running out. I don't have much more time to win a Super Bowl. I'm over 80 years old. Let me go get the guy I think can get it done, and I'm going to go hire Sean Payton. But that's the only way I think that Sean Payton ends up here is Jerry sees that, that as his last best chance to win a Super Bowl. Dan Quinn, great guy, awesome defensive coordinator. I don't know that he's your answer in Dallas as head coach, but there's only one guy who makes that decision, ultimately with some influence right. and input from others around him, but it's Jerry Jones. Can we put up the schedule again? There was one thing that kind of jumped out to me as we are on the precipice of the start of the season. That Thanksgiving game in recent years has been a ratings bonanza for the NFL. Yep. I don't know that anybody is going to give two craps about Giants-Cowboys come week 12, Shireen. I think they decided, Mike, that everybody's going to watch no matter what because there's nothing else to watch, but we're put, going to put that to the test because both of those teams, you look at those schedules, both of those teams could have losing records by them and not be very good. It could be like that Detroit early Thanksgiving game. I mean, two bad teams and – well, what else are we going to watch? But that's going to be put to the test. Why else are we watching? Because it's on TV, and we will be watching, yeah. but I just, it's not going to be a compelling game, quite possibly, for either team by the time we get to week 12. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.